This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 8. Coming up on Space Time, more questions about last year's neutron star merger. The hunt continues for mysterious fast radio bursts. And tonight's total lunar blue supermoon eclipse provides a jargon trifecta. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers are puzzled by the continued brightening of the afterglow generated by the merger of two neutron stars detected last August. The spectacular collision, 138 million light-years away in the elliptical galaxy NGC 4993 in the constellation Hydra, sent gravitational waves rippling across the universe. The event, known as GW170817, was only the second ever direct observation of the merging of two neutron stars, and the first time a gravitational wave event was also detected in the electromagnetic spectrum. All previous gravitational wave detections involved the merger of two stellar mass black holes, objects with gravitational fields so strong nothing, not even light, can escape, and consequently would not have been observable by conventional telescopes. But unlike black holes, neutron stars do emit light. A neutron star is the super-dense stellar corpse of a star more than eight times the mass of the Sun, which has ended its life in a spectacular core collapse supernova explosion. What's left is an object between about 1.4 and 2.16 times the mass of our Sun, but all condensed down to an object just a dozen or so kilometres wide, and so dense that just a teaspoon of neutron star material would have a mass of over a billion tonnes. The two in-spiralling neutron stars which generated GW170817 were estimated to be between 1.1 and 1.6 times the mass of the Sun. New observations from NASA's Earth-orbiting Chandra X-ray Observatory, which have been reported in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, indicates that the gamma-ray burst unleashed by this collision is far more complex than scientists initially imagined. The study's lead author, Daryl Haggard from McGill University, says jet emissions generated by short-period gamma-ray bursts usually get brighter for a short time as it smashes into the surrounding medium, but then fades as the system stops injecting energy into the outflow. However, he says this one's different, and it's definitely not just a simple narrow jet. The new data could be explained by using more complicated models for the remnants of neutron star mergers. One possibility, the merger launched a jet which shock-heated the surrounding gaseous debris, in the process creating a hot cocoon around the jet that's glowed in X-rays and radio light for many months. The X-ray observations match radio data reported last month, which also found that emissions from the collision have continued to brighten over time. While radio telescopes were able to monitor the afterglow continuously since the collision, X-ray and optical observatories were blocked for about three months because that part of the sky was obscured by the sun from Earth's point of view for that period. And when the source emerged from that blind spot in the sky in early December, the Chandra team looked to see what's going on, only to find that the X-ray afterglow had brightened just as it had in the radio. This neutron star merge was unlike anything astronomers had seen before. And this unexpected pattern has sparked a scramble among scientists trying to understand what physics are driving the emission. The neutron star merger was first detected in gravitational waves on August 17th last year. It was picked up by both the LIGO Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatories in Washington State and Louisiana, as well as Italy's new Virgo Gravitational Wave Detector near Pisa. In addition to the gravitational wave observatories detecting it, the event was also detected by some 70 ground and space-based gamma-ray, X-ray, ultraviolet, optical, infrared and radio telescope observatories. And so the discoveries opened a new era in astronomy. It's marked the first time scientists have been able to observe a cosmic event with both light waves, the basis for traditional astronomy, and with gravitational waves. The ripples in space-time predicted over a century ago by Professor Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity. Neutron stars are the densest objects in the universe other than black holes. And mergers of neutron stars are important because they're thought to be responsible for producing kilonovae. A kilonova occurs through the merger of either two neutron stars or a neutron star in a stellar mass black hole. The event triggers a rapid neutron capture process, which produces about half of all elements heavier than iron, such as gold, platinum and silver. 
GW170817 is thought to have produced about 16,000 times the mass of the Earth in heavy elements, including approximately 10 Earth masses each of gold and platinum. Theorists had previously predicted that when neutron stars collide, they should give off gravitational waves and gamma rays, along with powerful jets emitting light across the electromagnetic spectrum. And GW170817 did indeed give off a gamma ray burst. The gamma ray burst was detected by NASA's Fermi Space Telescope and soon thereafter confirmed by the European Space Agency's own gamma ray observatory. Both space observatories confirmed it was a short period gamma ray burst, and so these new observations confirm at least some short gamma ray bursts are generated by the merging of neutron stars, something which previously had only been theorised. It was the gravitational waves which told scientists that the merging objects had masses consistent with neutron stars. And the flash of gamma rays tells them that the objects are unlikely to be black holes, since a collision of black holes wouldn't give off any light. But while one mystery appears to have been solved, new mysteries have merged. The observed short period gamma ray burst was one of the closest to Earth, yet it was surprisingly weak for its distance. The merger of two neutron stars can lead to four possible outcomes. Either the immediate creation of a stellar mass black hole, the creation of a hypermassive neutron star, that's an object with a non-rotating mass of more than 2.16 times that of the Sun, which would then proceed to collapse into a stellar mass black hole in less than a second, the creation of a hypermassive neutron star which would collapse into a stellar mass black hole over periods longer than a second, or the creation of a stable neutron star. As to which of these four possibilities occurred would depend on how much mass has been retained by the resulting object, as well as the composition and properties of matter inside neutron stars all of which are still matters yet to be resolved. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Mystery still surrounds the origins of fast radio bursts. Those strange, rare, incredibly powerful, yet incredibly short millisecond bursts of energy from objects billions of light years away. And astronomers still aren't sure whether they're all produced by the same sorts of events or if there is more than one way to generate a fast radio burst. Less than two dozen have been confirmed since the first was detected in 2007. And with one exception, they all seem to originate from different parts of the sky as single one-off events. Now, all that seems to point to some sort of gigantic catastrophic event, something like a supernova explosion of a star at the end of its life. But there's an exception. There is one fast radio burst, known as FRB121102, which repeats on a regular basis. And that points to the possibility of at least one additional method for generating them, possibly something like a highly magnetic young neutron star called a magnetar. And what looks like being one of the best fast radio burst detectors ever developed is the CSIRO's Australia Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder, or ASCAP, located east of Geraldton in outback Western Australia. The array found its first fast radio burst after less than four days of searching. The findings were reported in the Astrophysical Journal Letters. The discovery of the burst, named FRB 170107, was made by Dr Keith Bannister and his colleagues from the CSIRO, Curtin University and the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research. At the time, they were using just eight of the telescope's 36 dishes. FRB 170107 came from the edge of the constellation Leo. It appears to have travelled through space for 6 billion years, almost half the age of the universe, before finally arriving at the ASCAP dishes last year. The burst's brightness and its apparent distance mean the energy involved must have been enormous, making the whole thing extremely challenging to explain. The authors were able to make the detection using an unusual strategy. Usually ASCAP's dishes all point to the one part of the sky but they can also be made to point in different directions, and this multiplies the amount of sky the telescope can see. Eight ASCAP dishes can see around 240 square degrees at once. That's about a thousand times the area of the full moon. The FRB 170107 burst was found as part of a research project called CRAFT, the Commensural Real-Time ASCAP Fast Transient Survey. Because the burst was extremely bright, Bannister says Kraft made finding it easy. We've been working on, 
on this fast radio burst search mode with the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder for a while now. So um, we've had a few telescopes to play with and we've been getting all our software and everything in place. Check out to see if this mode works or not. And then uh, it sure did because we looked through the data and bam, there was an FRB right there. Okay, up until now, since the first one was discovered, we've only found 24 or thereabouts. Yeah. What does this tell you that they're likely to be? Because that's the big question, isn't it? So it looks like there's a potential to find lots of these things, but determining their origin is because they're so far away is still the issue, isn't it? That's right, yeah. We certainly don't know what they are, and it turns out there's more theories for what these things are than there are actual births. You know, as you say, there's only 24, and there's way more than that. You know, there's probably 50 theories or more going up every day. So it's a huge topic of inquiry in astronomy at the moment. And as you say, if you just collect one, sadly it doesn't tell you where it came from in as much detail as you'd like. So at the moment, certainly finding a few more will be helpful, but also there are a few other things, especially with this telescope, we'll be able to, in the next 12 months, really pinpoint where they're coming from in the sky. So once you can do that, you can nail an FRB to a particular galaxy. And once you do that, then you you have a lot more information because if you know what type of galaxy it comes from, then you can say a little bit about what types of things are in those galaxies and maybe work out what's responsible for the FRB. Now, with this particular one that you guys found, have you been staring at the same part of the sky to see if it repeats? Because there's only been one example of a repeater, and that's a real outlier compared to everything else. And we still don't know what they are, but if they do repeat, then that must mean something. That does, yes, you're absolutely right. So, as you say, there is only one repeater, and we have been looking at it, and we've actually gone through some of our old data to see if we can find any weaker pulses that might have come from this particular direction. And we didn't find anything obvious, to put it that way, and we're still following up with some other bigger telescopes to see what we can find. But um, yeah, the repeating thing is really a, it's a tricky puzzle because the vast majority never repeat and we do look and we don't see any repeats. But in one occasion, the repeating does happen and that tells you a huge amount. That rules out a whole class of models. It can't come from exploding stars, for instance, because usually when a star explodes, there's nothing much left. And if it does repeat, that means we could be looking at some sort of a pulsar or possibly a very hungry, supermassive black hole somewhere. Yeah, that's right. As long as it's something that can live long enough to um, emit lots of, ev- uh, lots of births, then you know you're in the right ballpark but even then it's hard to work out certainly it could be a pulsar but it's a very different sort of pulsar than what we have in our own galaxy because our pulsars don't make anything nearly so bright that's the thing isn't it the new one that you guys have found that was what six billion light years away that's almost halfway across the universe it is indeed yes if it's that far across the universe then it has to be prodigiously bright for us to be able to see it so uh that sort of object we just we really have no good understanding for what type of object can be that bright this is all very reminiscent of the search a couple of decades ago for mysterious explosions, the most powerful explosion since the Big Bang. I am, of course, referring to gamma ray bursts. We now know what they are. It took a long time, and they were really hard to track down because they were so ephemeral. This is so reminiscent of that. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And uh, and the, the key thing with the gamma ray bursts, if you talk to that community, the key thing was when uh, when someone managed to localize one, so really get a great, a good, you know, a pinpoint accuracy position for uh, the gamma ray burst when it happens, and everyone found that out and what that position was and trained their telescopes there and were able to look at the afterglow. And once they had that, very quickly, the people started to understand what gamma ray bursts are and it turns out they're exploding massive rotating stars. So with fast radio bursts, they've been really tricky to pinpoint. They have been pinpointed in one case with the repeater, as you described before, and that is telling us something, but it doesn't quite tell us everything yet. So more positions or good positions will be the key, to, I think, to unlocking the secrets of FRBs. So what do you actually see with the radio telescope when you look at a fast radio burst it's just what a sudden peak in a signal or how does it work it's a little bit difficult to describe over the phone so i'm going to wave my arms around and you're not going to see any of it but that's um, all right i do radio so, i can understand yeah yeah <laughs> So it's um, what we do is we record uh, the signals from the telescope and we, re- we record them at uh, a range of different frequencies. So in the same as radio, imagine with your radio dial, people probably don't have those, have those anymore. But anyway, we record different radio frequencies or radio wavelengths. So the long waves and the short waves and we get them all at once. And the thing about a fast radio burst is that it's dispersed, which means that the short radio waves arrive first and the long radio rays arrive last. So what we're looking for is a signal where you see a little bit of emission starting in the short radio waves and then it gradually starts to arrive in the long radio waves and that's the signature of the signal we're looking for but basically that blip comes and goes in about a millisecond or much less actually so you're looking for a real needle in a haystack and they're all roughly the same in terms of the way they look their characteristics they're all dispersed so they all have that characteristic sweep but the useful thing about frvs is that that sweep tells you how much matter that the burst has actually gone through between where it came from and our telescope so while they all have that sweep the amount of sweep is different for different bursts because different bursts 
universe come through different amounts of matter. And that's the very exciting thing about them is that every time we see one, it tells us straight away how many electrons or how many atoms it's gone through to get to us. And so with that fact, we can use it to work out the weight of the universe, we hope. Hmm, work out what the universe's mass is between us and the FRB. That's right. Yeah, it's a very, a very exciting possibility, and it's something that you can only do with FRBs you can't do with any other technique. That's Dr Keith Bannister with the CSIRO. I'm Stuart Gary, and you're listening to Space Time. Well, depending on exactly where on Earth you are right now, January 31st could be a busy time for sky watchers, with a total lunar blue supermoon eclipse jargon trifecta for your listening and dancing pleasure. First, there's a total lunar eclipse happening tonight, the first time the moon's been completely immersed in Earth's shadow since September 27, 2015. Secondly, the eclipse comes just hours after the moon reaches perigee, its closest orbital position to the Earth, which during a full moon is these days sometimes referred to as a supermoon. And thirdly, while some places will already be in February thanks to time zones, the rest will still be experiencing the last hours of January, and hence a second full moon in the month, a so-called blue moon. A total lunar eclipse occurs when the Sun, Earth and Moon all align. During this event, the Moon passes completely through the Earth's dark shadow or umbra. Now, even though the Earth completely blocks out any sunlight from directly reaching the surface of the Moon, the Moon is still visible during a total lunar eclipse. You'll see the moon will gradually get darker and take on a rusty or even blood red colour as the light from the sun refracts through Earth's atmosphere and undergoes Rayleigh scattering, leaving only the longer red wavelengths as all of Earth's sunsets and sunrises happen at once to indirectly reflect onto the lunar surface. A total lunar eclipse can also look yellow, orange or even brown in colour, depending on how many different types of dust, particles and clouds in Earth's atmosphere allow different wavelengths of light to reach the lunar surface. Tonight's celestial spectacle starts at 10.48pm Australian Eastern Daylight Time and it ends at about 12 minutes past 2 early tomorrow morning. It'll be visible throughout most of Australia as well as Western North America, Eastern Asia, New Zealand and across the Pacific. The lunar eclipse takes place just a few hours after a full moon lunar perigee, a so-called supermoon. The term supermoon was invented back in 1979 by an astrologer, not an astronomer. For those unfamiliar with the difference between the two, an astronomer is a person who studies space and the cosmos using the scientific method to learn more about the universe. An astrologer, on the other hand, is a person who uses inaccurate positions for constellations, planets and other celestial bodies at different times to make up stories telling others about their character or to predict their future. There is no and has never been any scientific evidence supporting any of the claims made by astrology. On average, the Moon orbits around 384,400 kilometres from Earth. But the Moon's orbit around the Earth isn't a perfect circle, it's slightly elliptical, meaning one part of the orbit will be a bit closer to the Earth, about 357,000 kilometres, that's known as perigee, while the other part of the orbit will be slightly further away, about 406,000 kilometres, known as apogee. That's a difference of about 7% either closer or further away than average, and that consequently also affects how bright the Moon looks. And the distances at perigee and apogee and timing also vary due to several factors, such as whether the lunar orbit's long axis is pointed towards the Sun. Also, the Moon's orbital extremes are greatest during November through to February because that's when the Earth's closest to the Sun. You see, the Earth's orbit itself is also elliptical by almost 2%. And therefore, the Sun's gravitational influence is greatest during those months. Now, technically, the correct astronomical term for a supermoon is a perigee and full moon. But the thing is, trendoids like to use the term supermoon to describe not just a perigee and full moon, but any new or full moon within, say, 90% of perigee. These things aren't terribly accurate. Still sensing an opportunity, NASA has adopted the term as a means of educating the public about astronomy. So, will the supermoon look especially big and bright compared to a regular full moon? Well, the truthful answer is no. Although it can be up to 14% larger and 30% brighter, you wouldn't really notice the difference unless someone told you. And even then, any size difference perceptions that you do have would more likely be due to your imagination. See, in reality, you'd need proper astronomical equipment to measure the difference. After all, we've all seen how the full moon looks unusually large and bright and yellow when it's near the horizon. It's an effect known as the moon illusion. 
Also, supermoons aren't really all that uncommon. They generally occur in groups of three about every 13 months in 18 days. Therefore, about every 14th full moon will be a supermoon. The one thing that may be noticeable will be slightly larger than usual tides. Many factors influence the tide's height at a given location, although they're usually highest, what's known as spring tides, at new and full moon when the sun, earth and moon are aligned. So a perigee moon being a bit closer than average will result in slightly higher tides. The last time a total lunar eclipse occurred near perigee was back in September 2015, when the two were less than an hour apart. For many listeners, the spectacle also provides a second full moon for the month of January, a blue moon, and the third part of our jargon trifecta. Now, originally a blue moon was the third full moon in an astronomical season with four full moons instead of the usual three. In the process, correcting the timing of the last month of the season that would otherwise have been expected too early. In other words, it happens when a year which normally has 12 full moons instead has 13. However, it's more recently become the name given to a second full moon occurring in the same calendar month. This second definition was the result of an error that was originally made by an amateur astronomer who misunderstood the basis for calculating the seasonal blue moon in an article he wrote for an astronomy magazine in 1946. That error was then repeated both in an astronomy radio show in 1980 and in a popular board game by people who failed to properly fact-check the information. And of course, owing to the rarity of a blue moon, the term blue moons often also used colloquially to simply refer to any rare event, such as in the phrase, once in a blue moon. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study warns that billions of pieces of plastic are choking coral reefs across the Asia-Pacific region, with Indonesia's reefs being the most polluted. The findings, reported in the journal Science, examined 124,000 individual corals in more than 150 reefs between 2011 and 2014. Scientists found a third of the reefs are buried under roughly 11.1 billion pieces of plastic waste, massively increasing the risk of disease in vulnerable areas. Australian reefs remain relatively unspoilt with the lowest plastic concentrations. Indonesian reefs were the most vulnerable, with the coral disease risk increasing by 89% compared to Australia's 4%. Scientists found that reefs at greatest risk of disease had increased rates of skeletal eroding disease, white syndrome and black band disease, all of which can quickly kill coral. And they warn that plastic waste is only set to increase. In fact, they estimate that plastic pollution will increase by 40% to more than 15.7 billion pieces of plastic littering Asia-Pacific reefs by 2025. A detailed study of the genetic history of the Irish has revealed a rich history of invasion by the British, the Normans and the Vikings. The findings reported in the journal PLOS Genetics looked at the genetic code of 1,000 Irish people and over 6,000 from Britain and mainland Europe. Researchers found 23 distinct Irish genetic clusters separated by geography. The most purely Irish DNA was found in the west of Ireland, suggesting most invaders arrived in the east and only made it so far. A new study warns that diabetes and blood sugar problems can accelerate the brain's decline. The findings, reported in the journal Diabetologia, are based on a study of 5,189 older people. Researchers found rates of long-term cognitive decline were steeper in those who have diabetes compared to people with normal blood sugar control. They suggest efforts to delay the onset of diabetes and control blood sugar levels might help slow down brain function decline. The study is one of the largest to establish a direct relationship between a measure of overall blood sugar control and subsequent risk of cognitive decline. Chinese scientists have announced the birth of the first clone monkeys, made using the same stomatic cell nuclear transfer technique that gave us Dolly the sheep. The two genetically identical long-tailed macaques were born eight and six weeks ago respectively. Although they're not the world's first clone monkeys, they are the first to be born using stomatic cell nuclear transfer, which until now has always proven tricky to apply to primates. Previous clone monkeys were created using a much simpler technique. Stomatic cell nuclear transfer involves removing the nucleus of an egg cell and replacing it with a nucleus from another animal's body cell. The reconstructed egg then develops into a clone of the animal that donated the replacement nucleus. Sadly, the news isn't all good. 
as successful monkey cloning will simply allow labs to make populations of genetically identical monkeys destined for medical experiments. And finally for now, a skeptic's guide to cell phone radiation. Cell phones have now been part of everyday life for well over 20 years. And over that time, there has been no corresponding increase in the rates of head or brain cancers, the ones most likely to occur by holding a cell phone against your head. Both the Food and Drug Administration, which regulates the safety of radiation-emitting devices such as cell phones in the U.S., and the U.S. Federal Communications Commission, say scientific studies have failed to show any association between exposure to cell phone radiation and health problems including cancers, headaches, dizziness or memory loss. There have now been well over 500 scientific peer-reviewed studies over the past 20 years looking into the potential dangers of non-ionising electromagnetic radiation. And, depending on the design of each experiment, they've all generally reached very similar conclusions. The biggest provisos being whether 20 years is long enough for long-term effects to develop and whether enough studies have been done on infants and young children. But, of course, there are always going to be groups who honestly believe there is a link between cell phones and cancer. And it's easy to see why. People don't understand the physics. So, what's the science? Well, all known cancer-inducing agents, including radiation, certain chemicals and several viruses, act by breaking chemical bonds in strands of DNA, resulting in mutations. In the field of electromagnetic radiation, it's the ionising radiation at the ultraviolet X-ray and gamma ray end of the spectrum which causes cancer. At the other non-ionising end of the spectrum, where we see visible light, infrared, microwaves and radio waves, photons can have sufficient energy to heat material. After all, microwave photons cook food and boil water, but they don't come close to the energies needed to break chemical bonds, no matter how intense their radiation. Ionising radiation is carcinogenic because it can break the electron bonds that hold molecules like DNA together. But the photon energy of cell phone electromagnetic frequencies are more than 10 million times weaker than the lowest energy ionising radiation. Planck's law and the interaction between photons and atoms, and thus the entire body of quantum physics, shows that photons associated with things like power lines, Wi-Fi or cell phones simply aren't powerful enough to cause cancer. Oran Segev, president of Australian Skeptics, is a regular contributor to Space Time, and he joins us now to provide a skeptic's guide to cell phone radiation. Microwave radiation of the type used that's used in the microwave ovens can indeed cause significant harm. The thing is that there we're talking about it causes vibration in the water molecules and causes the substance to heat up, and it could potentially happen just the same in a human body. If you hold a microwave radiator close to your ear, then absolutely you will suffer harm harm, potentially significant harm. The thing is that your microwave oven is generally around a thousand watts uh, or more, whereas your phone is about one to one and a half watts. So it just doesn't have enough power to generate heat. Heat can cause harm to DNA in other ways. So heat is not harmless, but we're talking about very low radiation in terms of the amount of power, and therefore, again, we're talking about a low likelihood, a priori likelihood, that it could cause cancer. They've been doing these studies for up to 20 years now. Is 20 years long enough? I would say yes and no. So yes, in the sense that for almost everything else that we have seen, that we know causes cancer, 20 years would be enough, which is a strong claim, but it's a very important one. It does not mean categorically that there can't be a longer lag for this specific type of effect. So it's possible that specifically with this kind of radiation, it takes longer. However, that's not what happens with most cancer-causing mechanisms. Could there be something discovered in the future? The probability is not zero, but it's definitely very low. And in this case in particular, because the patterns of use have changed so much, I think it would be prudent to be even more cautious than usual. We've been focusing on cell phones and really not mentioning Wi-Fi much, even though Wi-Fi is actually quite prominent in terms of the kind of things that oh it's everywhere are, it's everywhere and people are also you know it comes up occasionally when you know some parents are worried about the wi-fi at their kids school and things like that and you know then they demand that the school remove wi-fi from the premises yes i've heard about it there are cases where people claim that the kids have gotten sick because of wi-fi yeah it happens the thing is wi-fi just like all rf radiation as you move away from the antenna of the wi-fi point the radiation decreases dramatically by the time you don't hold it again 
against your head. The radiation by the time that it gets to, to where you are, even from a few meters away, is so incredibly weak that the radiation from neon lights in classes and definitely from the sun when the kids go out to play is significantly higher. I don't think we need to take Wi-Fi claims very seriously at all. Cell phones, again, as I said, you know, it would be prudent to do more studies and wait longer. Wi-Fi claims are, are simply rubbish claims that should not be, should not be taken seriously. That's Aran Segev, President of Australian Skeptics. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio, and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary. At Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 